uh, the book of Luke. If you'll stand with me, I'll read the brief passage we're going to consider this morning. Luke chapter 12, and I'm beginning in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, opportunity once again to study, to consider some, some of the word that you have preserved for us, Lord, your infallible, inerrant message given to us over the blood of many people over the years who sacrificed to make this available. And we take it so for granted. May we not do so, but may we hear and then may we obey. See so many signs, Father, of our obedience these days. It is such a thrill, but we just want to get better. A long ways we know from where we really would like to be as far as our relationship with you and our obedience to you. So we pray for that. Be with our missionaries those who are serving uh, with us and for us in distant places. And uh, Father, over the next few weeks, I'd really like to uh, encourage our people to pray, uh, number one, for the VBS and the REACH camp that are coming up here on our uh, location, uh, for the VBS and the REACH camp in Michigan as the team goes in uh, late July. May we be praying for that urgently, that you will use them and then, Father, I pray for the Losi family, the, our missionaries to the country that we can, really can't mention publicly, but their visas are coming up, and at the end of July, this needs to be done and accomplished, and it's not clear that they're going to be able to get these where they are translating your word for people uh, far away. So we pray for that, and I pray that uh, all of our people here will join in praying for this urgent need over the next few weeks. Lord, please help us to be faithful, not just in doing, but in prayer. Help us to realize there's nothing more important we can do than that. And then, Lord, we pray that um, we will see your hand work in ways we never thought it could happen. Thank you for all that it means to us when that does happen. And thank you for yesterday. We pray that you will use the time there to your glory and to the lives of many people over time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. If you haven't already, please turn with me and Luke to Luke chapter 12. I hope you have your Bible. You need to bring your Bible each week. And I hear enough pages rattling. I know most of you are, and I pray that you will. God's Word. Colossians 3.1, uh, which I'm sure you all know, right, uh, says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Today is going to give us a little bit of an opportunity to see a little bit about what that means, to seek the things that are above. Some of you will remember the old comedian Jack Benny, vaudevillian who kind of made the transition into uh, television and uh, always represented himself as a great tightwad, you know, never paid for anything. One of his skits, one of his famous skits is he's accosted on the street one day by a by a robber who pulls a gun on him and he says, okay, your money or your life? And there's a long pause and Jack doesn't say anything and the, and the robber gets impatient. He says, come on, come on. And Jack says, don't rush me. I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> that wouldn't be funny, would it? Except that, except that money and the desire for money over, is easy, we're easily overcome by that, right? And so we can relate to this fact that it gets a stranglehold on us, just like it did poor old Jack. I'll give you an example. A sociologist from Boston University, Juliet Shore, did a study to find out how, how people do meeting their needs. And so she asked the question, can you afford the things that you need? How do you respond to this statement? I can afford the things that I really need. And when she got done, she said, you know, one third of the people who's, who make over $100,000 in their household responded, yes, I can buy the things I need. But of course, the obvious implication of that is that two thirds of the people 
who make over $100,000 a year in their household think that they cannot buy the things they really need. So the wealthiest people in the wealthiest country that history has ever known think they can't afford what they need. Now, I don't know about you, but what that tells me is that covetous and greed drives our existence way more than we realize. We either don't understand what needs are or we're being wasteful or something else. Given that tendency of the human heart, I don't think it's unusual to find that Jesus spends a lot of time talking about money. In fact, he had more to say about money than virtually anything else that he talked about, more than any other single subject. He realized that money and how people handle it is an index of a person's character. It can even be an index of whether they really have saving faith in Jesus Christ or not. When we get to Luke 19, we're going to see a small man named Zacchaeus that you've all heard about. And it's only when he is ready to open his tainted purse and begin to give back money that he has cheated from people that Jesus makes this statement in Luke 19, 9. He says, today salvation has come to this house. His attitude, uh, Zacchaeus' attitude toward money was a reflection of a transformed heart. Money is so insidious. It's, it's, a, it's an easy, concrete substitute for God, right? It's so tangible. I mean, you can do things with it. I can remember getting the first dollar bill that I ever had in my own little hands, right, that was mine. And I sat there in the, in the, in the farmhouse we lived in in Nebraska, and I just stared at that dollar bill for a while. I was so impressed to have a dollar bill. Dollars. Substitute for God. It's so tangible. Money speaks and we listen, Right? many times to our own destruction. So is the Bible against money? Is Jesus against money? No, he's not. The Bible makes some very positive statements about this. Deuteronomy 18.18 teaches us that God gives you the power to get wealth. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 says that it's God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. The Bible presents many wealthy believers. It presents some that are very poor as well, but there are many wealthy believers in the Bible. I believe, I'm I'm, I'm confident of this, that God loves to find people that he can trust with money. The problem is there aren't very many of them. Money quickly overtakes us. We quickly get wrapped up in it without even knowing it. And so the Bible teaches us it's the love of money that's the problem, not money itself. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, which often gets misquoted, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. See, when we, when we cross the line from seeing money and the wealth that God gives us or whatever, whether it's a lot of wealth or whether it's a little, when we cross the line from seeing it as something to be used for God's glory in whatever way he urges us to do and begin to see it as something to consume our own desires and fulfill all of our own desires, then we have fallen. Few of us can keep from crossing that line. So the Bible makes a promise in regard to this. Now listen to this. I'm I'm guessing it's a verse you didn't even know was in the Bible. It's in Ecclesiastes 5.5, where you've been having your devotions the last week, I'm sure, right? Ecclesiastes 5.5. Here's what it says. It says, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. What that's saying is that the, you know, the, the best way not to enjoy money is to want to. It's like, it's like one of those things that's difficult. You know, how do you become humble? The harder you try to become humble, the less you're humble, right? And money is a little bit the same way. The more you try, the more it seems to grab you. 
But when we make it a priority, we cannot enjoy it. When, the, the question is once asked of John D. Rockefeller, who at the time was the richest man on earth, filthy rich. He said, how much is enough? He said, just a little bit more. That's right, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. It's the easiest trap in the world to fall into because whether we have a lot or whether we have a little, it's just a little bit more that we want. <clears throat> we think we can manage it, but in the end, it manages us. We fool ourselves. We're like the judge who said to the guy that was standing before him, he said, I see that in addition to stealing money from this store, you also took watches and rings and jewelry. And the guy says, yeah. He said, I was taught from the time I was young that, that money alone doesn't bring happiness. <laughs> so I needed the rest of it as well. So easy to fall into this trap, but the guy was self-packaged for destruction and perhaps, perhaps we are too without even knowing it. And so we need to ask ourselves, what do we, what do we how's, how's money, what kind of a grip does it have on us? What is it, how does it play in the way that what Jesus is trying to teach here? So we're gonna, a brief series, two-part series on money matters. From Luke 12, verses 13 to 21, five points. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> frog in my throat and can't get it out. Five points. First two we'll take today, the next three next week. But the points are the inquiry in this passage, the indictment, the instruction, the illustration, and then the insight. So let's look at the inquiry beginning in verse 13 of this passage. The inquiry. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, if you look at that on the surface, it sounds like a simple little request, right? What's the problem? Well, remember the setting. If you, if you were to go back, and we won't go back and read it, but if we were to just go back to the, to the context just before this, what's been happening? Jesus is talking about like major spiritual realities, profound things. He's been talking about the fact that we need to be willing to confess Christ publicly. This is our confession of faith, of saving faith. He's been talking about the fact that there is something called an, impar an impardonable sin, which is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit of God. He's been talking about the fact that we need to fear the Father who can destroy both body and soul in hell. I mean, these are like earth-shattering realities, right? Groundbreaking truth, heavy subject. And in the middle of this, the guy steps up and says, teacher, um, tell me to, tell my brother to divide the inheritance, will you please? It's like he's oblivious. I mean, are you, are you kidding me? Jesus is talking about major life and death issues and this guy just wants his money. I can't believe that he was really listening, you know? I think he was like, we are in church sometimes, you know, and we're sitting there thinking about the ball game or a girlfriend or boyfriend. Hopefully that's not the married people that are thinking about that, but we, you know, we're, <laughs> we're thinking about all these things that are, that are the wrong things. Our minds are going to, what's the problem tomorrow that I have to solve? What is on the table for me? What is coming up? How come he doesn't hurry up? We're oblivious to reality. So this man missed what was going on. Now, the question we might ask is, did he have a valid claim to this money? He's asking Jesus, would you please tell my brother to divide the inheritance? Does he have a valid claim? And you know what? The Bible doesn't tell us. We don't know. It's clear there's a family squabble going on here, but we don't really, we can't take sides because the Bible doesn't tell us. I think there's a reason the Bible doesn't tell us. And the reason is, it doesn't matter. Now think about that for a moment because most of us would say, well, if, if, the, if the brother really owes it to him, then surely Jesus would be on his side. That's, a, that's how we would think, right? Wouldn't that be true? And I think by his answer, Jesus is saying, you know what? There are things that are more important than that even if he did owe it to him. That's how we have to look at this passage. There's something more important than money, even if it's owed to us. So this guy comes to Jesus. 
One of the reasons he's coming to Jesus is because these kinds of questions were often addressed to the rabbis, to the teachers in Jesus' time. So it wasn't unusual, it wouldn't have been unheard of that this man would be asking this kind of question. But you can, I mean, you can almost sense in the question his impatience, right? So he's kind of drumming, drumming his fingers, you know, is this guy ever going to get done? And, you know, finally when he gets the first opportunity and Jesus stops for to get a breath, he just jumps in. Teacher, 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 could you, tell, listen, tell, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. It's not even a request, it's a command. He's driven by crass materialism, completely indifferent to the weighty spiritual realities that Jesus is trying to teach here. His only reality is the inheritance. Now, is God interested in his inheritance? Yes. Yes. God is interested, beloved, in the things of here and now that are of interest to you. In the Lord's Prayer, what's one of the requests? Give us this day our daily bread. And we went through the Lord's Prayer. We said a couple of things from that. Number one, it's the only request for physical something in that prayer. So it kind of puts it in a priority. It's also asking for daily bread. It's not asking for monthly bread or yearly bread or annual income because God wants us to live a day at a time in dependence on him. But yes, God is interested in the things that are of interest to us. He sees every sparrow that falls, the Bible teaches us. He's interested. But this man, see, has made the inheritance his ultimate reality. That's the problem. It's not that he's owed an inheritance or not. The problem is that's where his focus is. That's what his God is. He's making the monumental mistake of prioritizing now over eternity. He's seeing the things that exist in the here and now as more important than the things that are eternal. It's such a common problem, right? So easy to fall into because what we see and what we deal with on a daily basis is what's important to us. But we forget how short now is going to be and how long eternity is. We, don't, we dare not do that. Because a thousand years from now and a million years from now and 10 million years from now, we're going to be thinking back on what we did now. And it's going to matter. I saw an interview with John Wayne when he was 71. He appeared on the Barbara, Baba, Baba Walters show. <laughs> she asked him how he liked watching his old movies. He said this, he said, it's kind of irritating to see I was a good looking 40 year old and then look in the mirror and see this 71 year old. I'm not squawking, I just want to be around for a long time. He was 71 then, he barely made it to 72. Now is short, eternity is long. And in light of that truth, Jesus is saying, be thinking about eternity. They have this quaint little custom in England. When somebody dies, I think I've told you about this before, so I, re I, I do realize I'm repeating myself, okay, I think. They have this little custom. They, they, when somebody dies, they publish the probate <laughs> in, the, in the newspaper. And so uh, Stuart Briscoe, who is a pastor in Milwaukee who came from England, was back home visiting his folks one time, and his father was reading the paper at the, uh, at the breakfast table, and he said to his wife, hey, Mrs. Jones just passed away. And so I said, oh, how much did she leave? The first question, right? How much did she leave? He said, everything. <laughs> she left it all. I was right, wasn't it? That's an eternal perspective. You're not going to take anything with you. Neither am I. Neither is anyone. It's a fool's errand to prioritize now over eternity. Is it important to deal with now? Absolutely. Is it foolish to prioritize that over making plans for eternity? Absolutely. Eternity is far more important than now, as important as now is. That's why Paul said, if then you have been raised with Christ. Are you? 
then seek those things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. That's where you're going to be. Invest there. Seek the things that are there. He was prioritizing now of returning. What's the second thing? He's using Jesus instead of worshiping Jesus. He's using Jesus instead of worshiping Jesus. See, I don't, I don't think when he came to command Jesus to ask his brother to divide the inheritance, I don't think he came primarily because Jesus was a rabbi, a recognized as a teacher, a rabbi in Israel, although that was part of it. But I think he, he primarily came for another reason, because he knew, he knew something that you would gather and that would jump out at you really if you just read the gospel of Luke all the way through at one sitting or any of the gospels, any of the synoptic gospels, any Matthew, Mark, Luke, you would recognize that Jesus talks about money a lot. And I think when this guy realized that, he thought, oh, here's, here's my champion. This is a guy who talks about money. This is a guy who knows about money. This is a guy who will help me. It's, 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 it's the subject that Jesus talks about more than anything except himself. Most of Luke 12 is about money. Don't stop coming, but you know, keep coming. It'll be good. Most of, you know, it started in Luke 3.14. It says when John the Baptist advises the people are asking him questions. Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations, but be content with your wages. It's there in Luke 8, 9 and 10 where Jesus sends his disciples out on these missions without any money. It's there in the parable in Luke 8. It's there all the way through Luke 16 and Luke 19. We'll see when we, when we get there. 11 out of 39 parables that Jesus gave are about money. That's 28%. Somebody's estimated that 20 to 25% of the teaching of Jesus was about money. Jesus is interested in this because it reflects our heart. And how we handle money and possessions and wealth and riches says something about us. It's a, it's a, it's a temperature gauge well, it's, it's, it's a way you can look at yourself and say, well, where am I with regard to my love for the Lord and my relationship with the Lord? So Jesus was talking about money a lot. And that's why this man comes to Jesus and says, hey, listen, you need to help my brother with this. He's, here's another issue with him. Not only is he probably not listening most of the time that he's hearing this sermon, but he's one of those guys who listens for others. I'm sure none of you ever do that. You know, he's the guy that's sitting there and he's thinking, whoa, I should, boy, man, I wish my brother could hear this. My, my brother needs to hear this. In fact, I might even get a copy of this and give it to him. My brother needs to hear this. That's what he's thinking. And so he's interrupting Jesus to say, could you please divide the inheritance, have my brother divide the inheritance inheritance with me, you're teaching on, you're, you know, you're teaching on generosity is so fabulous, you know, I love it. Never occurs to him, it might apply to him, right, but his brother, and so he says, he's my brother's holding out on me, you need to talk to him, would you please do that? He doesn't realize how much he's revealing his own earthbound heart, does he, right? It's his own heart that really needs this message, but see, here's, the main thing about this is it shows that he doesn't love Jesus. He just wants to use him. How many people claim to love Jesus when all they really want is whatever Jesus can give them that they want? He doesn't love Jesus. He wants to use him. Jesus to him is just a cash machine. He's his meal ticket. He loves what Jesus might give him. He loves what Jesus might do for him. But he doesn't love Jesus. We should never mistake that. And we should be asking ourselves what we're like. Family visiting New York City, right? And so they, they, they go to one of the big cathedrals there, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City, right there on Main Street. And they go in, and the mother... They, they get to the candle section, and so the mother's explaining to the children, you know, here, at this place you can buy a candle, you can, you can light a candle, and usually you say a prayer, a petition, or thanksgiving, or whatever, and, 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 and so you can do that while you're here. It's kind of a special place to do this. So all the kids lit a candle, and they got all done, and mom says, okay, great, any questions? And a little five-year-old, you know, Amy says, 
Don't have any questions, Mom, but if there's a pony on the steps outside, it's mine. <laughs> it's mine. We laugh because that one's so obvious, right? But we don't realize that that's what we do. Yeah, I want Jesus, but what I really want is what Jesus will give me. I want what Jesus can do for me. That's what I really want. So people come to Jesus as the answer to their problem, their money problem, their relationship problem, their financial problem. He's, a, he's just a fixer-upper. They see Jesus as a means to a greater end. See, if you're seeing Jesus as the means to a greater end, you don't know Jesus. There is no greater end. He is the end. Coming to Jesus for a greater end. Such people don't love Jesus. They love his blessings. And as long as he antes up, they're in. You know, we're in. As long as he does what we want, great. But if it doesn't happen the way we want, count us out. He's obviously not there for me. Maybe he doesn't even exist. Who knows? We're like the, we're like the girl who sent out the, you know, the invitations to her birthday party. She said, the pleasure of your presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, is requested. <laughs> Takes you a while to spell. Okay, that's good enough for me. I'm with you. I want the presence. I want what Jesus can give me. Beloved, what, what they don't want is the, is the Lord of the Bible. Who, what, he, what did he promise to his disciples? He says, he says here's what I promise you. You're going to suffer persecution. They're going to bring you in from the synagogues in front of the, of the rulers. You're going, to be, you're going to be tried. You're going to be uh, whipped. You're going to be beaten. Eventually, some of you are going, to be, are, going, are going to die for my sake. He told them that. Not too many people want that, Jesus. They want the Jesus that's going to give them presents. Jesus doesn't do presents. Jesus doesn't do presents, beloved. Jesus' gifts are for those who can say like the Apostle Paul, here's my desire life that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. That's the Jesus I want. To know. So, so does that mean we never ask Jesus for anything? Of course not. But the things we're asking for and the things we're desirous have to be on the level below him, not on the level above him. Do you see? Jesus cannot be the means to a greater end or he is nothing in your life. You're just fooling yourself. Some of us have been there, right? I've been there. I won't ever be there again. Jesus is looking for those who want him for who he is, not for some gift that he might give. See, that's idolatry. Jesus is not looking for idol worshipers. He's looking for Jesus worshipers. Jesus worshipers. Well, that's the inquiry. What about the indictment? The indictment in verse 14. Jesus refuses this man in very strong terms. His comment is a strong rebuke. He says, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? I don't think that's the answer the guy expected, or he probably wouldn't have been asking, right? But Jesus is doing this to point him to a purpose. He's pointing out the, the things we just talked about, but there's more. Why this refusal? Because throughout the Gospels, if, you, if you've read the Gospels, if you've even been with us in the book of Luke, you know that Jesus constantly refers to himself as being the one who will one day be the judge. He's the judge. The Bible, very specific about that, right? There's coming a day when he will judge right and wrong. He will judge those who have refused him and those who have accepted him. He will sit on the throne of the universe and he will divide those on earth between the, what the Bible calls the sheep and the goats, those who are believers and those who are not. And Jesus will do all this. He's a divider. He's a judge. Look at the word arbitrator there in verse 14. I, who made me a judge and an arbitrator over you? Why am I arbitrating for you? The, the, the word is the, it's the Greek word meristes. If you go down to verse 49, look at verse 49, because you're going to see that he says there, I am a divider. What, it, what's the issue here? How come he's a divider in one case and another one he's not? Look at verse 49. He says, I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. 
I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it's accomplished. Do you not know that I, do you think I've come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. For from now on in one house, there will be five divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. That's probably not news, but you see what the point is, right? (laughs) Jesus says, I'm a divider. My very presence is divisive. Those of you thought Jesus only came to bring peace, you know, just haven't read the gospel, right? But how can he say, I'm, I'm not your arbitrator up here, but down here he says, I, I am an arbitrator. I am, it's the same word. It's the same word, by the way, that's down there to divide. It's the same word as arbitrator up in verse 14, I'm not an arbitrator here. I am an arbitrator here. What's the point? Well, I think the first thing we have to ask is, in what way does Jesus divide? How does Jesus divide? And the answer to that is, Jesus divides people because he's always talking about himself. He's always talking about himself. How would you like someone who's constantly interrupting you and say, you know, okay, enough about you. Let's talk about me. I think there's a country song like that, right? Wasn't it one of those guys? Let's talk about me. Well, in a a normal person, that would be insufferable, right? I don't think any of us would stick around that person very long. But see, in Jesus' case, this is what he had to do. This is what he came to do. He came to bring heaven to earth. Jesus came to to be the mediator between God and man. Jesus came for big purposes. And the only way to get the message across was to talk about himself. And so he represents by his very presence and by every word he says, he represents the question of all questions for every life that's ever lived. What have you done with Christ? That's the question that will happen at the end, right? What have you done with Christ? It's everything because with Christ, if you have invited him into your heart and life as your Savior and Lord, with Christ, you have everything. You have forgiveness from guilt. It's a $50 billion industry in the United States in which we live. You have forgiveness from sin. You have cleansing. You can go live with yourself as well as with others. You have peace with God. You have reconciliation reconciliation, you have redemption, you have all of these, you have adoption into the family of God. I mean, you have everything. You have heaven. What is it you don't have with Christ? You have everything. But without Christ, what do you have? 80 years of whatever you can gain. That's it. You have nothing beyond that. You're done when this life is over. And I know that 80 years seems long now. Believe me, when you get to my age, it doesn't seem so long. And when you get a little further along, it'll seem short to you too, because it isn't very long. In light of eternity, it's very short. With him, we have everything. Without him, we have nothing. And you know what that means? That means that Jesus is the most divisive subject there is. And you know that. You mention the name Jesus at your work, among your friends or wherever, you're going to quickly divide people, right? It just does. Because you're either an acceptor of Jesus, a believer in Jesus, or you're a denier of who he is and what he came to do. Jesus divides by his very presence. Jesus is a divider. So how can he say one moment, I'm not a divider for you, but then a few verses later, he says, I am a divider. Here's what he means. What he means when he tells that man, I am not your divider. I'm not your arbitrator. I'm not your divider. What he means is this. He means I did not come for this kind of division. I did not come for this kind of judgment. I didn't come, I didn't come to divide your inheritance before I divide your person. I didn't come to be your judge for now until I'm your judge for forever. I need to be your savior before I can take an interest in who you are and what you're doing now. You don't get my message if you think I just came to give you an inheritance. You've missed the point. That's why he goes on and says in verse 15, 
take care. Take care. That means look out. It means make a note of this and go live it. Take care and be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. He realized that whether this man deserved his inheritance or whether he didn't, his life was consisting in his money, in his possessions. And so either way, he's on the wrong track. He's saying, I didn't come to help you get that which you think is going to make you happy. You do not, I came to tell you this, I came to tell you you don't exist in your possessions. Your life is not about those things. You think it is, but it's really not. Your reality, your possession, I came to talk about reality. Your reality, your possessions, not going to last very long. My reality, eternal life, through the death I'm about to die on your behalf, my reality lasts forever. You need to get concentrated on that. That needs to be your first priority. Say it another way, I'm not here to get you the things that you think are going to make your life. I'm here to be your life. I'm here to be your life. We come to Jesus like this, and sometimes we've kind of been encouraged to do this, you know. I'd like to become a Christian, thinking about becoming a Christian, but I have a lot of investments, so Lord, would you please, you know, stop the fluctuation in the stock market. I'd like to become a Christian, but Lord, please tell him or her to marry me. I'd like to become a Christian, but, you know, I got this, I mean, my wife just doesn't understand me, you know, please, you know, just change her. I'm thinking about becoming a Christian but tell the critics what a great person I am, what a great artist I am, what a great teacher I am, what a great businessman I am, what a great whatever I am. Let people appreciate me. I want to come to Christ and I want to know you. I think you're a pretty good person. So get me the thing that I want most in my life. Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. You're on the, you're on the wrong level altogether. You're on level one. I'm up here on level seven. I'm at the top of the building. You need to join me up here. I didn't come to give you the things that you think will make up your life. I came to be your life. I didn't come to fill out your agenda. I came to be your agenda. I've come to set your life on fire. I've come to change you from the inside out. I've come to be your everything. And you just want me to be some little thing that's not going to last five minutes. I didn't come for that. I came to be your eternal life, not to be your now. I'll sure I'll help you with now. You get now in the right position and in the right priority, I'm there for you. That's not my purpose for coming. You don't even understand how now I ought to act in light of what I want to do for you. You don't. You think you need that inheritance. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. You come to me and I'll sort that out. See? Do you see how this works? Jesus isn't saying, now please understand this. He's not saying, give me your money, give me your things. He's not saying that. If you, if, if you give Jesus your money before you give him your life, you know what? That's death. That's death. People do that. People do that all the time. People, people give money to make hospitals. People give money to make shelters. People give money to build orphanages. People give money to build churches, like our building fund. And then they turn around and say, well, maybe God will accept me now. But beloved, that's death. You can't buy God. You can't buy God. <laughs> he doesn't want your money. He wants you. And he wants you to want him. That's how it works. It's the only way it works. That's what Jesus meant when he said, man who made me a judge or arbitrator over you for your now issues. That's not why I came. He's got it backwards. He's indicting him. You have all your priorities backwards. I can't help you with now until you let me help you with forever. So, 
How do we conclude? When someone sticks a gun in your face and says your money or your life, don't be caught saying, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, right? Don't be caught there. Learn to think in terms of eternity. Learn to think in terms of the long term. Learn to think in terms of where this is all heading. You know, you offer a child a choice between some candy and a banknote. What's he going to take? He's going to take the candy every time, right? Because he doesn't have his priorities right. There's no perspective. There's no ability to think beyond that. And Jesus is asking us, think beyond the candy. Think to eternity. Don't be a child in eternal issues. You don't have time to be a child in eternal issues. You, you need me. John Newton illustrated this 18th century illustration, the guy that wrote Amazing Grace, who had been a slave trader right before he wrote that, came to Christ, wrote that amazing song. But he illustrated this principle this way. He says, suppose you have a man who has gained a great inheritance. He's been given millions of dollars. And he's got to get to New York City in order to collect his inheritance. So he takes off to try to get to New York City. But he's, as, he's, as he's one mile outside of the city, his carriage breaks down. And so when we catch up with him, there he is wringing his hands and saying, oh, my carriage is broken, my carriage is broken. All he has to do is walk one mile to get a million carriages. Newton says, that's what it's like to be concentrated on the inheritance instead of concentrated on the Savior. Just as foolish. Don't be there, beloved. Don't use Jesus. Treasure him. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. That's where we want to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. It is challenging, no doubt. No doubt uh, it would be easy for, uh, I would imagine most of us, to go through our life and say, you know what? If we are a Christian, if we have come to you at some point in our life by faith and said, yes, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, if we have done that, we can still live in the kind of lifestyle that we had before. It'd be easy to go back to that. Not to unsave us, but to make us kind of wasteful in the meantime. But Lord, there may also be those who are here today who have never really come to saving faith in you. They've never really understood what it meant never been kind of explained this way. And so whatever the condition of our heart, Lord, just in these few moments, would you please teach us what we need to do to apply this to our life? Maybe it means to say, you know what, from now, from this point forward, the most important thing in my life is going to be Jesus Christ. Everything else is going to take a back seat to that. That would be the right decision. For others of us, it might be having made that decision See, I need to reevaluate. I need to relook at my priorities. I need to make sure that I've got them in the right place and that I'm doing and concentrating on and thinking about and spending my time on the right things. Help us, whatever the need, to respond to you now. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.